My name is Jeff Testani. I am a guest editor for the JSKI Special Edition on Transcatheter Interventions for Chronic Heart Failure. I'm also Associate Professor of Medicine at Yale. Um, so I'm honored to represent JSKI and Dr. Alexander Lansky, Editor-in-Chief. Uh, you can find us online at jsky.org or follow us on X, formerly known as Twitter, at uh, MyJSKI. Um, JSKI is the home of all the official Sky documents. So we are here today to discuss an important document published in JSKI titled Hemodynamic Monitoring Devices for the Management of Outpatient Heart Failure. Uh, so I'm joined by a steam panel of uh, Sky leaders and experts, uh, Scott Lundgren, Assistant Professor, Division of Cardiovascular Medicine, uh, Division of Cardiovascular Medicine, University of Nebraska Medical Center, and also Bill Abraham, Professor of Internal Medicine, uh, Phys Physiology and Cell Biology, Division of Cardiovascular Medicine at Ohio State. Uh, so thank you both so much for joining. And I'm gonna turn it over to Scott uh, to start the conversation and highlight why this is an important document. Yeah, thanks uh, Dr. Shastani for that uh, kind introduction and invitation to um, kind of give this uh, this talk on the paper that uh, just came out uh, in JSKY. Um, I'd like to start a little bit about um, why this is important. So we know heart failure is uh, exceedingly common. There's over 6 million patients uh, in the United States alone that have heart failure, and that prevalence continues to worsen uh, and increase over the years as our uh, population continues to get older uh, and risk factors become more common. Uh, and we know that it's associated with high rates of mortality. I mean, the, the um, uh, median survival is 50% uh, at about uh, five years, uh, and it's expensive. You know, over $30 billion is spent uh, each year on heart failure, and again, that number continues to increase. Uh, each year with the rising prevalence of heart failure. Uh, and we know patients that get admitted with heart failure, uh, usually they do uh, even worse. So uh, first admission for heart failure, uh, median survival is cut in half to two and a half years. Um, and then with a second uh, heart failure hospitalization, median survival goes down to another uh, about a year and a half. Uh, and each time these patients are admitted, it's harder for these patients to get to uh, get back to their, uh, their baseline um, with the subsequent admission events. Uh, and why we like to discuss and want to talk today about hemodynamic monitoring devices uh, is because previous trials have not shown benefit uh, from other uh, remote monitoring strategies. You know, nurses uh, calling and assessing patients' uh, signs and symptoms of heart failure, uh, their daily weights uh, has never been shown to be beneficial. Even intrathoracic impedance uh, with our implanted devices uh, have not shown uh, reduction in hospitalizations or improvement in outcomes. So, um, so far, uh, hemodynamic devices um, seem to be it. Um, so why hemodynamic devices? Well, we know that um, pressures within the heart and lungs actually go up uh, often one to two weeks before those patients start developing symptoms. So before they start uh, noticing that they're short of breath, before they're orthoptic uh, or they, they have weight gain. Uh, the development of these, uh, these increased filling pressures, this fluid overload, uh, is associated with poor quality of life uh, and are what lead to uh, frequent hospitalizations. Uh, we know uh, that by measuring these filling pressures, uh, we're able to, uh, again, be proactive in their management. Notice these filling pressures are going up earlier. Uh, call them and assess their symptoms uh, and optimize or adjust their medications uh, before uh, they develop symptoms, before uh, they come into the hospital. Uh, and this, in, uh, this improvement in uh, communication uh, with our nursing and provider teams uh, uh, leads to improved outcomes. Uh, and those outcomes um, seem to be a significant reduction uh, in heart failure hospitalization. So a uh, large majority of trials that have been done looking at hemodynamic monitoring this population uh, show a pretty consistent 30 to 35 percent reduction in heart failure hospitalizations, as well as an improvement and quality of life, uh, you know, uh, quality of life scores uh, tend to go up about five to ten points uh, consistently across uh, all trials. So now I think the bulk of the talk is going to be on what devices are available. Um, uh, I think the main device that's being utilized right now are the pulmonary artery pressure uh, monitoring devices. Uh, and again, the workhorse uh, has been the CardiMEMS for over uh, for almost a decade now. Um, so currently, CardiMEMS is the only commercially available device. Uh, it's FDA approved in 2014 and ex uh, it received an expanded indication in 2022 um, for, um, for implantation. So right now, 
FDA approval is for uh, patients who have NYHA class 2 or class 3 symptoms, uh, previous heart failure hospitalization within the last uh, 12 months, and or uh, now with the expanded indication, uh, elevated BNP or NT pro BNP alone. So uh, these patients uh, can now be uh, NYHA class 2 um, who just have an elevated BNP, uh, maybe you're adjusting their diuretics, uh, that might be a patient population that would benefit from uh, implantation. Uh, with the CardiMem device itself, uh, preferentially placed in the left pulmonary circulation, so ideal vessel size is about seven to 10 millimeters. Um, you like, we like a vessel that's kind of uh, posterior, so back behind the heart improves uh, signal uh, uh, with the device. Uh, and then we like it to go superior to inferior directed, uh, again, uh, to try and help uh, hone in on that, uh, that signal. Uh, implantation is done through a 12 French sheet uh, with the, the app that provided delivery system. Uh, and now both uh, FDA indication for uh, IJ or for moral access. So previously used to be ephemeral, uh, and then uh, a lot of programs started using off-label IJ. Uh, now it is FDA indicated uh, for IJ access as well. Um, again, since it's the only commercially available product, uh, has the majority of the clinical trials uh, and the evidence supporting use of hemodynamic monitoring devices. So uh, again, consistent reduction in heart failure hospitalizations has been the main outcome that has, uh, has been seen. Uh, this was also, uh, seen in the most recent um, uh, randomized clinical trial, the GUIDE-HF trial, uh, that showed, again, significant reduction in heart failure hospitalizations when using CardioMEMS compared to uh, standard of care. Um, and again, improvement in quality of life. So uh, this is the Monitor HF trial uh, that was published just this year uh, that shows utilizing um, uh, pulmonary artery pressure monitoring with the CardioMEMS device uh, led to a significant improvement in KCCQ score uh, compared to those patients who had uh, standard of care. The next device that I want to talk about, a still pulmonary artery pressure device, uh, is the Cordella device uh, made by Indotronics. Uh, so uh, it's pretty similar, uh, at least in design uh, and uh, placement to uh, CardioMEMS, uh, but there's some notable differences. So this one's exclusively placed within the right pulmonary circulation, specifically uh, the interlobar artery. So that's why uh, it looks a little bit different, kind of taking advantage of that uh, anatomical location. Um, one of the benefits of, of this device is its delivery system. So it has a torque catheter. Uh, and that torque catheter allows for uh, a little bit more uh, better adjustment of the orientation of the device. Uh, and then it comes with a stability catheter, which allows for uh, injection of contrast through the delivery system uh, without having to remove the device uh, and reconfirm uh, placement and location. Um, pressure readings com are combined with vitals data. Um, so uh, these patients not only uh, send in their pulmonary artery pressure uh, readings, but they also uh, send in blood pressure, heart rate, um, O2 sat, uh, and, uh, and weight measurements uh, to give a little bit more information to their writer team uh, to help uh, uh, adjust and, and uh, optimize their management. Currently, this device is being uh, studied uh, in an ongoing clinical trial called the Pro uh, Proactive Heart Failure Trial, uh, again, looking primarily at uh, NYHA class 3 patients uh, at this time. So stepping back uh, out of the lungs uh, and looking at uh, some additional hemodynamic devices that are, again, currently in clinical trial uh, and on the horizon. Uh, first one is the VLAP device. So um, this is an interatrial septal placement uh, device. Uh, has a sensor um, that uh, is, uh, is present uh, in the middle of the device and, and gets into the left atrium and actually measures those pressures. Uh, and then these two nitinol braided uh, disc anchors uh, that kind of help uh, keep it in place. Um, 12, French or 12 French trends for moral sheath. Uh, and again, it's a transeptal device, so transeptal uh, delivery system provided with the device. Um, the Vector HF trial has previously been done looking at the uh, benefit of this device. And, and I think the first thing it showed excellent safety profile. Um, so no significant short or long-term uh, complication rates with, uh, with this device. Uh, good correlation with pulmonary capillary wedge pressure readings that were obtained uh, months later uh, via right heart catheterization uh, and an improvement in six minute walk distance. Uh, and these patients all also had uh, more statistically significant reduction on their NYHA class. And then last device I wanted to talk about today, um, kind of the newest on the block is the Fire One device. Uh, so this actually comes out of the, uh, it's not even in the heart nor the lungs. Uh, this is an IVC sensor, so uh, placed within the inferior vena cava. Uh, and what this does, it measures the area of the inferior vena cava uh, and the change in that area over time. Uh, so this device consists of um, uh, 
coil of wire uh, with a capacitor, uh, and that creates an electromagnetic resonator. Uh, patients utilize a, a belt uh, that they uh, put on over uh, overlying the device uh, that powers the device and allows them to check uh, their measurements. A uh, little bit bigger delivery system for this device. It is 16, uh, 16 friends transfer wall delivery system. Um, and uh, just recently started a uh, clinical trial for this device just this year. So first in human uh, implantation was done earlier this year uh, as part of the future heart failure trial. And then lastly, um, to kind of in my part of the discussion, I just wanted to talk at least um, for me personally, who I think benefits the most uh, from these implantable hemodynamic devices. Uh, so if, if you're making frequent adjustments in diuretics on patients or GDMT adjustments, uh, those patients oftentimes would benefit uh, or you would benefit from uh, kind of monitoring uh, or having more uh, hemodynamic or vital data uh, to kind of manage those patients. Um, again, Based off the indication, patients that are being hospitalized uh, with heart failure benefit from hemodynamic monitoring. I think that's uh, that's true. If you have uh, patients that are coming in at least uh, you know even once, uh, definitely patients that are coming in multiple times uh, with recurrent decompensated heart failure uh, would benefit from a little bit more information. I think hemodynamic monitoring uh, is that information. If you have patients, it's difficult to assess their volume status. So maybe they're the ones that collect uh, their volume centrally, uh, or they have got a larger uh, body habitus. Uh, I think having hemodynamic um, uh, numbers can help you monitor. And manage those patients a little bit better. Uh, difficult to manage volume status. Again, we have all have patients where uh, they get a little fluid overload. You go up on their diuretic, they get hypovolemic and their creatinine goes up. Uh, again, having uh, a little bit more information to kind of guide those therapies uh, can be helpful. The devices only work if these patients are taking in or, or sending readings. So uh, they have to be willing to uh, adhere to taking those readings at home uh, multiple times a week. Uh, I tell my patients once a week is not enough because it's hard for me to, to evaluate a trend if you're coming up or you're coming down. Uh, so again, some uh, some previous compliance uh, or uh, or thought that they're going to be compliant with this. And they have to be able to communicate with the team. If we need to make changes, we have to be able to get a hold of the patient uh, to make those changes. I think lastly, as somebody who provides um, rural outreach care uh, to the heart failure population, I think those patients uh, that live further or have a harder time getting to clinic, whether it's transportation issues uh, or distance from clinic, uh, hemodynamic uh, monitoring devices uh, are really helpful in that population. Uh, they can stay closer to home uh, and uh, we can monitor them uh, a little bit more closely. So I appreciate everybody's time and uh, thank you for allowing me to discuss our review article and look forward to the discussion. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, thanks so much, Scott, for a, a, a great overview there of the paper and, and the field. Um, <clears throat> so I, I wanted to start by discussing with the group, you know, how do these things work? So, you know, it, it seems like an intuitively obvious question, but like putting that little doohickey in the pulmonary artery obviously doesn't make people stay out of the hospital. Um, there's a lot of diuretic changes. We think diuretic, more diuretic is usually bad for people. The most recent analysis of GUIDE says that, that there's almost as many up titrations as down titrations of GDMT. So why, why are these so effective in keeping people out of the hospital? Yeah, I think I'll uh, I'll start and then I'll let Dr. Abraham because he's had way more experience in, in this field than I have. But I think it's um, it's a team based approach, right? I think having that additional data um, is is always helpful. And I'll, I'll I tell patients or I tell providers that are, are wanting to start some type of remote monitoring program like a Cardi Mems program. Putting the device in is easy. That's the easy part of it, right? It's it's kind of developing a team and managing that uh, those patients uh, afterwards. So I think it's um, you know we've seen from Guide um, that. The standard of care is not truly the standard of care, right? So these patients continue to get phone calls. Uh, they continue to get uh, assessment of their symptoms, but still, despite that increased patient contact, um, the patients that uh, the, the cohort where uh, the cardiomems pressures, those PA pressure uh, readings were utilized, uh, still had a significant reduction uh, in outcome. So I think it's having that additional piece of data uh, that really allows you to hopefully optimize that further, uh, get ahead of their symptoms and keep them out of the hospital. Yeah, I, th I think that's right. First of all, Scott, fantastic presentation. That was a wonderful, wonderful summary of of the field, really. And you know, I, I you know, I think uh, the key observation which Jeff has noted is that in all of these trials, uh, in Champion, in Guide, et cetera, you know, what we've seen is that there are about as many down titrations as there are up titrations of diuretic dose. So that over a period of time, say six months or a year. You know the average diuretic dose uh, doesn't change, and and this really is sort of an ultimate form of personalized care, personalized healthcare, 
uh, based on a physiological rather than a biological or genetic marker uh, for heart failure for, for heart failure management. So the idea here is that the patient gets just the right dose of diuretic at the right time on a very individualized basis. Uh, you know, different than what we often do in heart failure. Typically, as patients worsen, you know, there is a unidirectional upward, you know, movement in diuretic dose, and we don't often or always go back and lower the diuretic dose again. And the, the those elevated doses, those sort of sustained elevations in diuretic doses are associated with a worse outcome. Uh, we avoid that because we're giving patients just the right dose at the right time. Excellent. Excellent insights. <laughs> so one other thing, and, and, and sort of dovetails into what Scott said about, you know, the team approach is when, and, and Bill, you've had a lot of experience with this in the journey with CardioMems. You know, so the FDA always wants the ultimate placebo-controlled trial, and they want to know exactly how much is this versus versus being in the trial. And, and I get that. In, in real life, we don't give a placebo pill to people to try to get placebo benefit. But I'll tell you, so this is unpublished data at Yale. We're a pretty big cardiomem center. When we look at the number of hospitalizations in our cardiomem patients the year before versus the year after implantation, it's like a 60% reduction. And that is meaningful to the healthcare system, the patients, to everybody. And to be honest, I don't care if that has anything to do with the PA pressure signal. And this is really borne out in the clinical trials, right? So, so guide uh, technically a negative trial um, with you know non-significant heterogeneity between pre and post COVID, zero change in quality of life, so on and so forth, because the control group had so much non-standard of care intervention. Whereas when we look at monitor, a profound reduction, and that was really like that was the question: if you put a put the implant in somebody. And 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 use that to to guide their care. So, are we? How should we be thinking about this, really, from a trial standpoint and and from a clinical practice standpoint? Yeah. So, I think at some stage in the development, and particularly, uh, you know, regulatory as well as clinical development of these devices, we have to do our best in trial design to sort of isolate the effect of hemodynamic guidance from all the other things you know, that are enabled. And we've worked really hard to do that in trials. And I think despite in those clinical trials really raising uh, the quality of care for the control groups, we've been able to demonstrate statistically significant and clinically meaningful uh, benefits to patients. But this is one example of an approach to treating heart failure that once translated to the real world, uh, produces, uh, if anything, even better benefit, right? So we have a number of publications now that have looked uh, or generated real-world data with the use of uh, CardioMEMS that demonstrate one, uh, you know, even better reduction of pulmonary artery pressures than what we were able to accomplish in the randomized control trials, uh, and two, uh, a greater treatment effect. And those two things correlate very well, the reduction in PA pressure and, and the magnitude of treatment effect. So, you know, in that regard, I would say, you know, this really is the real thing. Uh, you know, it was established using, you know, really rigorous randomized control trials that tried to control for everything, you know, even, even to the, you know, point of having scripted interactions with patients and, and equalizing the amount of contact be you know, between study centers and both treatment and control patients uh, to real world experience where clinicians are left to their own. Look, we thought when this got into the real world, we had concerns about patient adherence, we had concerns about clinician compliance. Would they actually use the data? Would they lower the PA pressures? And guess what? They did it better in those real world experiences than we did in the clinical trials. Fantastic. Um, yeah, so, so what other what other thought, and maybe this dovetails a little bit into the future directions here. You know, so clearly a big advance, uh, you know, and as you said, in real life practice, maybe even better than in randomized control trials. But even in randomized control trials where everything's done really well, for instance, guide, you know, we see 20, 30 percent reduction in heart failure events, depending on where you look. But that's on the background of 40 percent of patients still being hospitalized at one year. So the 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 you know the the unmitigated risk is still huge, and this is despite this being heart failure hospitalizations, which we think is mostly related to congestion. 
So, so why is it that there's so much risk that's that's left at the end of this? What, where's where's the gaps? Yeah, well, I, I'd love to hear Scott's uh, view on this as well, but let me just uh, take a shot at this. So, you know, first of all, uh, as you all know, the, the the mechanisms leading to elevated left atrial pressure, pulmonary and peripheral congestion are complex and involve both volume dependent and non volume dependent, you know, pathways. Uh, which I think, uh, you know, account for some of the, uh, let's say, unavoidable heart failure hospitalizations, even in patients undergoing uh, hemodynamic monitoring. You know, that's why perhaps in the future, you know, I might envision patients with a pressure sensor uh, in the left atrium or the pulmonary artery, along with some sort of volume sensor, you know, such as the, uh, the, the example that Scott presented, the Fire One device, which is now under investigation because knowing both volume and pressure might help us uh, optimize our treatment algorithms and keep even more patients uh, out of the hospital. There are at times adherence uh, issues that uh, result in failures of hemodynamic uh, guided heart failure therapy. And the last thing I'll mention, which has been difficult for us to figure out how to capture in these clinical trials is that the appropriate use of an implantable hemodynamic monitor you know, should probably result in admitting some patients to the hospital. You know, the endpoint that we've pursued because it's a simple one is just simply keeping patients out of the hospital. But what we found is that somewhere between 10 to 20 percent, 15 to 20 percent of patients have pressures that no matter what you do or what you try, you can't lower down into the optimal target range. Those patients have very high event rates. They ought to be considered sooner for advanced heart failure therapies, such as LVADs or transplants. Uh, when you admit them for those evaluations or for those devices, those count against you in the clinical trial, uh, but really might represent an appropriate use case scenario for an implantable hemodynamic monitor. Yep. No, I agree, Bill, with everything you said. I think one of the interesting things that's going to be uh, hopefully going to come out of guide is those class two patients, right? So I think uh, I think a lot of it is, and some of those class three patients, especially that had already had heart failure hospitalization, it's, it might be uh, pretty late uh, in their heart failure process to actually prevent, uh, I think, uh, further progression uh, and decompensation episodes. Uh, and like you said, I think there's some good evidence uh, of utilizing cardiomems in that sick population uh, to evaluate those patients who are going to be a candidates for advanced therapy. Therapies, especially those that have ongoing elevation uh, in their pulmonary pressures despite uh, GDMT and diuretic optimization. So I think it'll be interesting to see how the swing potentially goes in implanting more of those class two patients uh, that haven't had hospitalization yet, uh, because we do know for some uh, from some internal guide data that those patients already had elevation in their PA pressures. You know, it, well, we're, we're pretty bad at uh, assessing symptoms at NYHA class to patients and very subjective from provider to provider. Uh, but I think uh, targeting those NYHA class two patients might be uh, probably the more important population before they uh, develop that progression. Excellent. So we're running up on, on the end of our time. I wanted to open the floor. Any any other thoughts or, or concluding comments uh, from the group? No, I think one... One thing I'll leave it on is I, I think this is uh, it's an exciting field. I think um, you know Dr. Abraham has been uh, been involved in this uh, pretty much from the start, uh, and I've been lucky enough to to tag along and, and join in on this. Uh, and I think uh, you know implantable hemodynamic monitoring devices are, are not going to be just for heart failure uh, in the near future. There's already clinical trials going on utilizing uh, CardiMEMS uh, in the pulmonary hypertension population, which I think uh, will be a, a huge next step uh, in opening the field even further uh, to just goal and, and ideal and optimization uh, with, uh, with these devices. So I'm excited to see uh, where the field continues to go from here. And, and the only thing I'll add, Jeff, uh, you know, I really... Uh, you know, want to encourage clinicians to consider device-based therapies for heart failure patients. We focus a lot and sometimes endlessly uh, on titration of guideline-directed medical or drug therapies for heart failure, uh, but across the board, board device therapies, cardiac resynchronization therapy, primary prevention ICDs, cardiomems, et cetera, are, are underutilized in our heart failure patients. So, you know, I really hope we can move more solidly into an era where drugs and devices can be used hand in hand and uh, and we can improve the utilization of these, in some instances, life-saving and in others, uh, 
quality of life improving, hospitalization avoiding uh, device-based approaches. Excellent. Well, great concluding thoughts, guys, and couldn't agree more. A lot of really exciting uh, uh, things coming down the down the pipeline in, in heart failure device therapies in chronic remote monitoring. So uh, thanks so much for your participation, and uh, thanks for your attention, folks. Take care.